Word in Your Attic, a Zoom with a View. Oh, welcome to another Word in Your Attic with, I think, literally the hardest working man in show business, Rodri <laughs> Marsden. Rodri, very nice to see you. It's, uh, it, welcome. it's, wonder, it's wonderful to be here. I'm, I'm convulsed with spasms of anxiety, but <laughs> what's new? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but Rodri, you, you formed a group, didn't you? Article 54, who made a fantastic kind of disco album. Uh, the Shining Disco Symphony for the, for the Dark Days of Brexit. That's and right. you've done it again for lockdown, haven't you? So just <laughs> tell us about that. It's just out, in fact. It's quite funny you say that because someone tweeted at me saying, he's done it again, which of course is one of the famous things you say to a, uh, to, to a band that you don't want to say whether it's good or not. <laughs> oh, you've along, done it again. With, only you <laughs> can put on a show like that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I mean, both records are basically a consequence of me suffering from terrible anxiety, such that I have to keep busy in order to avoid myself thinking too much about stuff. And I began the first one um, precisely for that reason, to stop me watching and thinking and reading so much about Brexit. And I had this idea of, of, of a band that sounded like Van McCoy and the Soul City Symphony, because I love the hustle and I love the shuffle, but as far as I know, he didn't really do very much else. I'm probably wrong. But so I, so I started kind of doing the music for what, might, what that album might sound like. Um, and eventually I thought, actually, why don't I make the album about Brexit or the rhetoric surrounding it? Um, and it, it did surprisingly well. I, I ended up on, on a, a BBC One news programme playing tracks from it to Lauren Koonsberg, which was weird. <laughs> Um, and you used you used actual speech, didn't you? Actual quotes, political quotes about Brexit, and turned them into lyrics. And you've done the same sort of thing with this new record, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really want to do another one because it was bound to be not as good, or people wouldn't like it as much. I mean, I know how these things go. Uh, um, but when lockdown happened, I was getting messages from people on social media saying, "Hey, are you going to do one about the coronavirus?" And I, to be honest, I held out mainly because the whole thing was so grim. I couldn't really bring myself to do it. Um, a friend of mine, Julia Craig, who, who ran the uh, rehearsal room where we rehearsed with Squitty Politi, uh, she tragically died of the virus quite early oh, on. And, oh. you know, when people start, people you know start dying, you know, making some banging tunes isn't really high mm. on the agenda. But um, after about a month into lockdown, I, uh, I desperately needed something to do. So I thought, I'll go for it. So it was about six weeks top to tail and people, uh, you know, recorded their bits remotely, sent them in and I, uh, I assembled them here. So, yeah, I, I was listening to a bit of it this morning. I mean, you, you can actually you can sample this, can't you, on, on, online at the moment yeah. uh, and order it. But t tell us in detail, I mean, not too much detail, but I'm, I'm a musician, <laughs> musician or technician, but it's fascinating to hear a piece of uh, a pop music which sounds so accomplished and sounds as if it was done in, in the traditional fashion, but obviously wasn't done in, in the traditional fashion. How do you do it? Well, I mean, obviously, technology makes that kind of thing easy in the sense that if you want your guitar to sound like uh, um, Nile Rogers, you know, you, you, you can, you know, you can scroll through the settings and find something that sounds vaguely approximate. You know, you don't need to, you know, own the precise amp or what have you. Um, it did, I, did, I did splash out on a load of hand percussion, uh, which I've, I've, I've brought. To show. I've got, I like this cabasa particularly. I'm, I'm, I'm playing this all the time. Right. Uh, and I also, I also bought... Um, these, which at school we were told these were called claves. But yes, of course, they now were. I, now I know they're clave. Cla it's, oh, it's clave. Right, of course right. it's clave. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I kind of, I, I wanted to know, I mean, it, it sounds stupid. Like, how do you play this? And you, yeah, go and on, course, just and do I'm, it. Just demonstrate for a second so we can familiarise ourselves with the sound. Well, this is, you know, I don't know if you're getting that through the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, yeah but, but right. I, I, wanted, I wanted to... Sound. I wanted some technique, so I went on YouTube. <laughs> How do you play the, the clave? Yes. And because, of, and of, and of course, you think, oh, well, it's just hitting two sticks together. And of course, the comments underneath the video are all, you know, dozens of people laughing, saying, oh, how do you hit two sticks together? But, you know, there is a technique. I mean, there is a difference between that and that. Oh, you know, there's a, I don't, but again, I don't know if you're getting it, but there's no, a very... Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. But, yeah. but that kind of attention to detail is, is throughout the, uh, the album, which I, I printed out. The album isn't ready yet, but I printed out the cover on A4. So it looks right, like right, right, right. And, uh, and I love uh, the tracks. You've got track, the tracks, again, are, are kind of cliches from the whole era. There's one called Unprecedented Times. There's one called The New Normal. Yeah. There's one called This Is Shit, which I think yeah. is, is superb. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm obviously, I, I, I worried about la laying myself open to the charge of being frivolous about something that is very, very serious. But 
I don't know. There's no rule that says you have to make um, sad sounding music about a situation that makes you feel sad. I, I mean, and it, and it certainly helped me take my mind off it. So you, you've got the, the, the vocals and so forth that are what everybody's providing stuff online. Are they, are they listening to it in real time and singing along with it in real time or are they just posting in their bits? How does it work? Well, the, it, of course there's this, <laughs> there's this um, misconception that musicians can operate over the internet in real time. You know, you keep seeing these videos of, of like, uh, most notably the Rolling Stones, supposedly playing together over video calls. As anyone <laughs> who's tried it will tell you, it cannot be done. It is, it is physically impossible to do. All of those videos are recorded separately and then stitched together later. So it's not as if you can have a little remote recording session or remote rehearsal. You know, we're all on our own. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I just sent, <laughs> I sent versions of, of, of the songs being sung very badly by me and said, could you do this except much better, please? Right, <laughs> um, right. So that's basically how it happened. Okay, so you've got, there's a kind of family of musicians around who contribute to this stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh, the, yeah trumpets from a member of the Hack, Hackney Colliery Band, uh, my friend Rob Smouten, who's in Hot Chip and Squishy Blitty, he, uh, he contributes a little bit. Um, uh, the, the drummer from Gong played on the last one, but I couldn't get him on this one, unfortunately. Oh, wow. <laughs> because, Sorry, uh, did you say the Hackney Colliery Band? Colliery Band, yeah. A, yeah, just a, <laughs> just, it's just a brass band doing, doing cool stuff. Oh, I see. All right, because it, it rather suggested there was a colliery in Hackney, which yes, obviously used to me because uh, you know I, I, I'm Yorkshireman, you know, so the, yeah. uh, colliery bands were real things to me. But anyway, yeah. okay. Well, enough. take take that up with them, I think. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so so the idea is people can can order this. You get it manufactured and then get it what in July or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's av I mean, it's available digitally now. Uh, if you go to Article Fifty Four dot EU, there's various links, but there is yeah vinyl coming in July. And uh, all profits go to NHS charities together. Charities, so. absolutely. Well, it's terrific that you've done it. it. Absolutely terrific. That you've well, done. thank you for, have you, have uh, you for, for get, letting me do have a lengthy you had a plug. Have to go through uh, any of your old records as we've all Yeah, been. I did. You probably had amount of time, but have you dug out any old things that uh, you remember fondly and read? Yes. I have. I mean, I worry that by bringing these first ones out, I'm kind of, it'll look like I'm jumping on a bandwagon that was uh, recently revved up by eminent rock critic and. Uh, all round good egg, Peter Perfides, because he revealed in his excellent book how much he adored uh, this band. Uh, the, um, oh, absolutely! <laughs> but I have to say that pretty much any music I've ever written has got a very strong uh, Wombles <laughs> undercurrent to it. I've got, I've got all four of them here. Um, so and I, I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, Dave, do you remember I once wrote a piece about the Wombles in Smash Hits? I think you probably uh, did. Yeah, and pointing out. <laughs> The, the great moments I thought were Minuetto Allegretto. Oh, like yeah. Wobbling White Tie and Tails. I don't know if you've got any other. Uh, uh, what, wobbling in the Rain is, uh, is obviously the, the best. But <laughs> I don't know. It's, there's, there's kind of a, a debate to be had, isn't there, about when your most formative musical experiences actually occur. And I'm guessing that most people would suggest that it's their mid to late teens because that happens to coincide. Uh, with the period of time they discovered Nick Drake or the Velvet Underground. But, yes. uh, you know, yeah. for me, it was undoubtedly between the ages of three and six when those, those fabulous records came out. My parents bought them for me. Um, and I, think, I just think they're masterpieces. Uh, yeah. there, there is a, there's a recording of me singing along to Wombling Merry Christmas, aged four, which is uh, incredibly cute. And in, in the past, in, in moments of extreme neediness, I've posted it on social media in the hope of getting some kind of... <laughs> prompting some affection but yeah, yeah no, it's <laughs> funny it's, it's funny it's really activated all that stuff isn't it i mean suddenly you know everyone is talking about these sort of uh, what would generally be considered to be rather cheesy things that they absolutely adored and meant a lot to them yeah a lot more people talking about the wombles is a is a, is a good thing in my book but, but also this this whole business about uh, about you know your early musical taste the your 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 uh, judgment on things when you're seven far more honest yeah. than they are when you're 15. Because when yeah. you're 15, what you're mostly bothered about is what it says about you. Precisely. Whereas yeah. when you're younger, I think when Danny Baker did Desert Island Disc, didn't he? he his discipline was that he, he only chose records that he would have heard before the age of nine or something yeah. like that. And he said, you know, I still love these records and that's absolutely fine. Mark and I, I were talking... Sorry. Sorry. I th I th yeah, I think it's safe to say that at the age of five, I, I was not troubled conceptually by the concept <laughs> of the Wombles. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, Mark and I have been talking about the eternal appeal of children's records. I was supposed to be doing this thing, which was uh, 
cancelled because of lockdown, where you're supposed to go along and talk about a record that changed your life. Right. Honestly, I can't think of a record that changed my life, really, if I'm honest about it. But, but I wanted to talk about the Teddy Bears Picnic. Yes, yeah. it's a record that profoundly affected me at the age of five or six or whatever. And they still play now to my grandchildren. It profoundly affects me still. You know, it's just got some vibe to it. You know, presumably but, the one yeah, has there's, as well. There's a lot well, of stuff that used to be played on Junior Choice that, that, that is, that, yes, I, th I think has, has affected a <laughs> millions I think of people. Bears Picnic had a, a, a very sinister undertow. Oh, very. I was terrified. The idea that you actually went down to the woods, this was going on, made it quite clear to me that you shouldn't go anywhere near the woods. <laughs> and I think uh, I think the Wombles doesn't have any of that. It that doesn't mention to it. I think you can all, you can also <laughs> only go down only go down to the woods if you've been good as well. Which is... <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, can we move on like a yeah, decade? Yeah, go on. Or so? What you got? Go on. Well, yeah. I've, I've, I've got I've got the first single and the first album I ever bought. And oh neither, right. Not, neither of these are particularly extraordinary, but again, I kind of believe it's better to be honest about these matters than pretend that my first single was Kraftwerk and my first <laughs> album was Magma or whatever. So uh, yeah, my first single was was Club Tropicana by Wham. No picture. <laughs> oh <scene>. yes. <laughs> and my memory of this is, is where that drinks are free. Yeah. My memory is that the single actually came free with a pair of Clark shoes. You know, you bought the shoes and you could choose a single from the top 10 that you would like to accompany said shoes. Uh, and I chose this and I, I still love it as I do the, the, the whole of the first Wham album. I think it's great. Um, the first and, Wham and, album is a masterpiece, surely. Yeah. A ray of sunshine, these brilliant bass lines and it just it's yeah. beautiful, it's really well constructed. It's wonderful. Uh, and my first album <laughs> was, uh, was the Jam's greatest hits package? Oh, right, yes, no. Um, and like, and all the boys who who attended the school I went to in Dunstable, uh, Bedfordshire, were were mainly mods. If you can claim to be a mod when you're twelve, but there was a shop like next door to the school called Family Affair, which sold stay pressed trousers and bowling shoes, which is which what most of my friends would be wearing. And then the, the school down the road, they had all the skinheads you see, and there was probably some. The odd, yeah. the odd middle class fracas between the two. <laughs> not, not that I'd know. I, I'd, I'd have been at home doing my homework. But yeah, I felt, I, I felt some peer pressure to buy this record, but I do still like it very much. I, I remember I went into town with my dad to buy it, and then he took me to a piano lesson, which was like half an hour, and he would sit outside in the car. And when I came out, he was sitting in the car reading the inner sleeve of this gatefold thing, which it's, it's, um, it's excerpts of Paolo who it's biography of the band but it contains bad language oh really and it made me feel very very uneasy that my dad knew that i had bought something with rude words on it <laughs> <laughs> which gives you an insight into my upbringing but uh... <laughs> So you, were you, you you did all the piano lessons you did all the grades and all, all that yeah, yeah, yeah. They, and I know it looks like I'm about to do a kind of Mrs. Mills and leave you both <laughs> in a, a chorus of Hello Dolly, but uh, it doesn't. It's just MIDI controllers. It doesn't make any noise. Uh, right, yeah. right, right. But yeah, I, yeah, I, I did all my grades on piano and bassoon uh, were, were my instruments, and then I did music at university even. Uh, oh really? I've got to ask yeah. you: Is your TV themes um, outfit still going? It kind of is. We're, we're, we're kind of flung all over the country now and three quarters of us have kids, some of them very tiny. So it's quite, it's quite hard to get together and play stupidly loud versions of 30-year-old We, we put you on now. once at a Word magazine uh, gig, I can remember. And, yes. Uh, they called yeah, Dream, we, we, Dream Themes, that's right, yeah. Correct, and, yeah, uh, we still, we still do. If you don't know about Rodri's band, they are absolutely extraordinary. You play Fantastic. all theme tunes for TV things like Match of the Day, don't you? And uh, yeah. you know, just these which is one minute sections. It's just so nostalgic. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's, we still do a double bill of a, of a gig and a pantomime uh, every Christmas at the Lexington, <laughs> which, which we hope we'll be able to do uh, this year. But uh, right. I mean, I know the Lexington's been um, kind of uh, trying to get donations to keep going. So I very much hope that will still be there when right. we emerge from all right. this. No, sure, sure. What else you got there? What else have I got? Um, well, kind of things move fast, don't they? When you're when you're a teenager, a couple of years after after Club Tropicana, there there were these two, obviously two cultural colossuses, if that's a word, that made me completely question what music was. And one of those was obviously John Peel, who, who I'm sure I'll mention again in a minute. Um, but the other one was uh, Channel Four's The Tube, and uh, and there were two things in particular on that show that completely. Uh, blew my mind, and one of them was one of them was the art of noise. Oh, uh, right. Okay. In, in their 
earliest ZTT incarnation using kind of these fair lights and um, found sound and turning it into music. I literally could not b believe my ears. I mean, and, and now, of course, in retrospect, I, I recognize that they did have kind of antecedents in, in the world of pop music. But for, for a 13 year old from Dunstable, I, I don't know. I think it was the drums, um, which I now know was sampled from a, a Yes recording session, but they, they they, they make these entire songs out of just these thundering drums and very little else. And, and I, I, I listen to it now and still find it completely thrilling. Get a complete head rush. I remember yeah. playing, I press remember shots playing. of themselves as spanners and things, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. Which is very <laughs> I, thrilling if you're a journalist. How I do you deal know, with this group? I don't know if it was exactly at this time, but I feel I have loads of memories of working on Whistle Test. Well, you were always, um, they could never get over the idea that, that people were starting to be able to sample any sound and turn it into music. Yeah. And so you could always get a cheap TV item out of, so you're going to break a piece of glass and then you're going to, you know. Play the call to C. And then, <laughs> absolutely. And nowadays, <laughs> you, you think about it, you think they're not remarkable at all. You can probably do it on your phone. You know? Yeah, indeed you can. The thing about the art of noise records is that I, they, they, I mean, they do sound of their time, but they're, they're, they're not, they're not lobbing it, lobbing all those samples in the pot in a real, I, I don't know, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I mean, yes, they did make a noise of, of a car starting, which was used liberally across all their records, but it, they, I think they were quite selective right. in their, and then, in their, in their yeah, approach. Sure. The other yeah. band I saw on the tube that, that, that I remember coming into school on the following Monday morning and, uh, and people saying, my God, did you see that terrible band on the tube was, uh, was Stump. And, um, and, and again, like now I know I'm aware of where some of their sound came from, the whole Peru, Captain Beefheart, Brand X kind of axis. But I have to confess, I'd never heard of Stump. Have I? Okay. Was it Chris Salmon was in that group? Chris or? Salmon was in, Kev yeah. Hopper, who I, who I was later in a band with as, as well. Yeah. But uh, again, like, for someone who was like classically trained like me, um, I was like, hang on, this song isn't in any key and the rhythms are all wrong, but I, I actually think they mean it to be this way. You know, they've created their own world and, you know, they're not going to make it um, easy for us to understand what on earth they're doing and why. And like throughout my teenage years and 20s, that was the music that I uh, really loved, that beef hearty and awkward, difficult, really? incomprehensible stuff like Bogshed. Big flame, a witness. Oh, all, 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 all very beloved of John Peel. That's so um, bog Peel. Shit. Just hearing the word bog shed and hearing the word bog shed. Stop, stop <laughs> and bog shed. Later on, bog shed. Bog shed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're going to pull out a bog shed album. Now, I'm not. Right? I'm not. But what, what I do have, I, I'm talking quite a lot, but I, don't, I, I, re I rarely get the chance to talk to anyone. So, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. We're a social service, Rodri, as well as everything yeah. else. Thank goodness. This is the first gig I ever went to, which I, I framed the poster. This is another John Peel favourite. This is Dog Faced Hermans and Bastard Kestrel. Oh, Bastard Kestrel, I remember them. Yeah. Bastard Kestrel, fa famous for Simon Bates refusing to say the words Bastard Kestrel when he was doing a trailer for John Peel's <laughs> programme. <laughs> Are you framed as a memento? That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I, he I, heard, I heard that band on John Peel's show. And it, that, I mean, Dunstable was like a cultural wasteland like you thought no bands ever came here of course again since i've discovered that some of the brightest and best soul groups of the 70s played at the california ballroom oh of in, course in, the in, california yeah but i was only seven or eight then so they yeah, wouldn't, let me, wouldn't let have me been. in you know. but uh, <laughs> but yet my first game my dad my dad took me to that gig in the car and he stood at the back like my dad's quite an imposing figure he's about six foot six six foot seven tall he stood at the back <laughs> wearing a suit with his arms folded, with a look, kind of look, look of amusement on his face, and then you know, bastard Kestrel come on. His face. <laughs> and uh, again, and of course, it was extraordinary. And uh, and afterwards, um, I bought a hand stapled fanzine from some guy. It was called Rabid Turtle. And again, that completely changed my world because I, I didn't realise you could make your own magazine. What? So I made my own fanzine called... Um, oh, you made one, Glottal Stop. Glottal Stop, yeah. That's right. There was some controversy involving John Peel with that, wasn't there? Am I right? Oh, not a great controversy. I mean, wonderfully, I sent him a, co I sent him a copy of it. Uh, and, he, um, and he wrote back saying, hey, do you want to come on my... Show? He used to do a local radio show on Sunday nights on East Anglia, in East Anglian Radio. Um, and he said, do you want to come on the show? So my dad drove me up to, again, my dad, oh, the, the chauffeur, drove me up to BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. And there, and uh, yeah, I was on, 
I, I met John Peel, and th there is cassette evidence of this interview, but it, it's 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 very it's bad. I like I, I like the idea of your dad dutifully taking you to all your pa piano lessons, and then seeing you develop a fascination for the likes of bastard Cantrell. <laughs> yeah. Kestrel. He yeah. must have. Did he ever say but that money? Where was have well I spent. gone wrong? Or <laughs> he wanted no, you to do the next Mozart. They've been uh, no. My my folks have been re remarkably supportive throughout all my strange <laughs> strange musical endeavours. So I'm, I'm I'm sure many times they thought, "What on earth is he doing?" But um, but yeah, bless him. <laughs> I've got to ask you. I've got to ask you about another thing, um, which is one of my favourite things on the internet mm. that you are responsible for every Christmas. Uh, which there may be some people who haven't seen this where basically people photograph the um, bedrooms in which they're staying at their parents' houses yeah. for the duration of the festive season. And you post them. And it's the most glorious thing. You must be so proud of that. It's, well, I mean, I, I don't know whether pride is the right word, considering it's, you know, I'm, I'm merely curating, uh, curated, you know, other, other people's uh, stuff. But... Um, yeah, it is a lovely thing. It's been like 10 years now. It'll be 10 is it years really? this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, yes, it's, I, I have a... Tiny box rooms, isn't it? You know, people squashed into their father's office or whatever. They've got a little double bed. It's always, there. There's a row of machines. Yeah. <laughs> always. Yeah, or ele <laughs> electronic <laughs> drums are quite common. <laughs> it's, so, it's so true. Of there's something so, so poignant about those, the, yeah. the lighting of those pictures. Yeah, I can look <laughs> Them for hours we yeah don't... it's great that it's great that people ha seem to have no qualms about about <laughs> posting pictures of their very horrible decor you know um but, uh yeah it, 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 yeah it's a great thing their, their, their parents that's right I, I have a kind of changing relationship with twitter really i mean it's i've, I've been on there for a long time but uh, i engage a lot less these days because i don't like getting cross and it's becoming a lot more difficult not to be cross yeah, so, no, yeah no. i do i do try and restrict myself to posting kind of whimsical in consequential <laughs> and, and, well, tend to, and tend to hemorrhage followers as a result. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing a wonderful thing in, in that, uh, in the annual Christmas thing, as you are with these, uh, you know, lockdown record, uh, records and, uh, and so forth. Thank you. Um, uh, I've got, I've got one got more thing more, to show you. Have you got one any more? Uh, one more thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah no. and, I, and, and, I, and I kind of, um, I'm almost embarrassed to hold this up because it's almost something of a cliche, but it's the, it's the culmination of, of, of that fascination with music that sounds wrong and deliberately so. And, oh. um, and, and obviously we're, we're all familiar with this, but it, yeah. it looms incredibly um, large in my uh, life. Not, not just because it's extraordinary artistic work. I, I did my undergraduate dissertation on it for my music degree. Oh, so really? I, I, yeah. So I took this thing completely apart and I know it inside out and, um, Completely, uh, completely adore it still. And uh, so, how old were you when you first heard it? Yeah, go on. Uh, I don't think I heard. It. I, I think I, I, I got into the bands that were influenced by it, right. it uh, Tra Trapmaster Replica, before I actually heard it. So I probably wasn't. I was probably eighteen when I first heard it. Right. And I don't know. I, I, there's nothing I can say about it that hasn't already been said. Really. I mean, we, we know now that Beefheart himself wasn't quite the musical genius that. Um, he made himself out to be, and, and it's been established more recently how much hard work the actual band did to bring it to fruition. But, you know, it, even, even to create the circumstances where a bunch of people are, are willing to go along with your mad idea is, yeah. uh, is, is achievement enough, I think. And, um, yeah, I, I quite like... I know, I, I know, I kind of see my, I don't, <laughs> I see myself as a bit of a roving facilitator of other people's excellent ideas, because I'm in I'm lo loads of bands, but I do like to think, oh my God, that's, that's extraordinary, I want to help that happen, you know, so I, I feel a certain kinship with the Zoothorn, Rolos and Rocket Mortons of this world. Have you ever, have you ever uh, gathered together a bunch of musicians and tried to make that sound? Uh... No, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I've, I've sat here and tried to make it myself. I've tried to kind of recreate it on, uh, you know, by myself as a solo thing. There are videos of you on YouTube of me hacking away at two guitars at the same time. Oh, right, right. Yeah, but no, I, I mean, I've, I've seen evidence on, 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 online of, uh, of bands getting together and, and, and trying and succeeding to, to do it. And, um, 
yeah. That's, a, that's a new level of devotion to Tramp Mask Rebel Control. I was just sitting there listening to it. It's going and actually trying to reproduce the entire album on your well, own. Well, the music. thing is that the, the moment where you realise that uh, it's composed and it's not random, you know, that, that every time they played it, they played it exactly the same. And so it is, you know, p picking it apart does become a real, it becomes very tempting because you know that it's, it, it's a thing. It's not like you're trying to recreate something that's random. You know, no. it's, uh, you're trying yeah. to recreate the composition. Yeah. So when you turned up uh, uh, to say you wanted to do your dissertation on Trout Mask Re Replica, did they go, what's that? Or did they say, oh, you're the 10th one in the last five <laughs> years? Or, I, I don't know. I don't know what happens on those things. Well, it was quite a forward-looking music course. And I, okay. and, I was, and I was fortunate to have a, a tutor, Dr. Steve Stanton, who, uh, who, who supported me in my endeavours. A, a man who, was the, who apparently was uh, the drummer in a precursor to Fairport Convention. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, I hope I've got that right, because it's going to look terrible. If I, no, if that's I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure yeah, you're right. I'm sure you are. But yeah, no, I was, I was given great support. And it, it, it got a good mark, as I recall. Right, right, right. So well done, me. So, uh, you, you, so your, your enterprises at the moment, you're still, the, the dream themes are still kind of, going when you can along scritty for yeah we were on the we were on the we were on the verge of announcing a few dates when lockdown happened and that's obviously um, now been postponed until goodness knows which, when but which yes is quite a rare event isn't it because it's quite hard to get green out of house and home and, and, and onto a stage he's, he's kind of like shy isn't it sometimes yeah yeah i think so but he he is he is always writing music even if he's not releasing it and um uh, yeah, he's a very dear friend, and I will always be there to facilitate his uh, his genius when he wishes to show it to people. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, Rodri, it's been delightful to talk to you. And the new and, album, uh, the new album's available now. You can get that. I mean, you, you can. Is, is it out of, and, and buyable now? It is buyable. Yeah. yeah. Article Article fifty four dot eu is the we'll, is where all the links are. We'll put the links. The other day that uh, we'll put the links on. Yeah, someone tweeted the other day that it should have been called Disco in Furlough. Oh, I, I wish I'd thought of that. I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> it is very funny. Very nice um, to see you, and we'll see you on the other side. Hooray, I hope so. Cheers. Take care, both of you. All Bye. the very best, Roderick. Cheers. Very